Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and in this video I will discuss biochemical differential tests, specifically those related to fermentation, cellular respiration, and reduction potential. This is the seventh in the series of ten lab sessions held as part of my online laboratory for the Fundamentals of Microbiology course. If your student currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and course Moodle site for assignments, quizzes, due dates, and other course information. The learning objectives for this unit include observing and describing the processes and byproducts of fermentation of simple sugars and carbohydrates, becoming familiar with the concept of an organism's reduction potential and the role for, of coenzymes in oxidation, and learning such concepts as aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Please note that the biochemical and enzymatic reactions included in labs 7 and 8 require the use of BSL-2 microbes and that can't be done safely at a home lab so we're not doing any wet lab procedures for 7 or 8. But you are going to be looking at videos and simulations and interpreting data that way. In general, microbes either undergo fermentation or cellular respiration. As part of cellular respiration, there's three major metabolic pathways. These are glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Every living organism carries out some form of glycolysis, suggesting that this mechanism is an ancient universal metabolic process. The process itself does not use oxygen. However, glycolysis can be coupled with additional metabolic processes that are either aerobic or anaerobic. Glycolysis begins with a single 6-carbon glucose molecule and ends with two molecules of 3-carbon sugar called pyruvate. Pyruvate may be broken down further after glycolysis to harness more energy through aerobic or anaerobic respiration, but many organisms, including many microbes, may be unable to respire. For these organisms, glycolysis may be their only way of generating energy in the form of ATP. The Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, its name named Krebs after its discoverer Hans Krebs and it's also called the citric acid cycle because of the chemical reactions that occur within the cycle. Unlike glycolysis, the Krebs cycle is a closed loop. The last part of the pathway regenerates the compounds used in the first part of the pathway. As one turn of the cycle returns to the starting point, the cycle produces two CO2 molecules, one ATP molecule, three molecules of NADH, and one molecule of FADH2. And Krebs occurs in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. The electron transport chain comprises a series of membrane-bound associated protein complexes and associated mobile accessory electron carriers. The electron carriers can pass electrons along in the electron transport chain because of their redox potential. For a protein or chemical to accept electrons, it must have a more positive redox potential than the electron donor does. Therefore, electrons move from electron carriers with more negative redox potential to those with more positive redox potential. The ETC produces a large amount of ATP and it can only occur in aerobic respiration. So glycolysis starts with glucose, ends with pyruvate, it makes a very small amount, relatively small amount of ATP, which is the energy in the cell. Uh, Krebs cycle, again, makes a small amount of ATP. The electron transport system makes the most ATP, but it can only occur in the presence of oxygen. So if you have bacteria that can't tolerate oxygen, they can't use the ETC. They have to use one of these or fermentation. And often fermentation will occur in combination with glycolysis because the end product of fermentation is usually glucose and then that glucose can then be used to make energy via glycolysis. But we'll talk some more about fermentation in a little bit. For now, we're still talking about cellular respiration. Um, cellular respiration can be either aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic respiration uses oxygen to produce energy in the form of ATP. The byproducts of aerobic respiration include carbon dioxide gas and hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Anaerobic respiration uses nitrate, sulfate, or another highly oxidized inorganic substance to produce ATP. Byproducts of anaerobic respiration include ethyl alcohol, hydrogen gas, and carbon dioxide. 
that. Fermentation is a metabolic pathway used by anaerobic microbes to make energy by oxidizing sugars in the form of simple sugars, carbohydrates, um, to produce NADH, which is converted to ATP via glycolysis. So byproducts of carbohydrate fermentation include organic acids, which lower the pH of the growth media that it's in. Also gases, which can be observed if they can be captured. More on this in a minute. Byproducts that are used in industry include lactic acid, ethyl alcohol, and carbon dioxide. Lactic acid is used to produce yogurt and cottage cheese from milk and sauerkraut from cabbage. Ethanol is a byproduct of yeast fermentation, and it's used to produce beer and wine. Carbon dioxide, which is also a byproduct of yeast fermentation, is used to make bread rise. So we already saw in lab six how you can test for fermentation of some sugars. So if you remember the McGonkey, EMB, and MSA agars all test for fermentation. McGonkey and EMB can test for fermentation of lactose. MSA can test for fermentation of mannitol. But here's a question. What if you have a bacterial specimen and you're trying to figure out whether or not it ferments lactose and it's a gram positive bacteria? But you can't use McGonkey or EMB to test test a gram positive bacteria because it's those are going to select for gram negative. So one way to test a gram positive bacteria for the fermentation of lactose is with a phenol red broth. The phenol red fermentation test utilizes an assembly consisting of nutrient broths containing a carbohydrate, and in this case we're looking at lactose, sucrose, and glucose. And you also have a pH indicator, that's where it gets its name. The phenol red is the indicator used in this test. And then you have a small inverted test tube inside of the broth. This is called a durum tube, and that is used to capture gas. So if you have fermentation that is producing CO2 or hydrogen gas as a byproduct, it will be get captured in this little tube. You'll have bu bubbles in your durum tube. The setup is used to determine whether or not the bacteria can ferment the lactose, sucrose, or glucose based on the color change. If fermentation end products are formed, like organic acids or ethanol, that makes the phenol red change color because the pH has dropped. So phenol red, when it has a higher pH, is red. And if you have organic acids or ethanols being produced during fermentation, that red turns to a more yellow color. And how, how much the color changes depends on how much of the sugar was fermented, but any drop in pH is going to be positive. So in other words, you don't have to have a color change that's drastically gone from bright, dark red like this to very, very yellow like this. All of these are considered positive for fermentation because all of these are exhibiting a drop in pH. And then you're also determining whether or not the bacteria can survive in anaerobic conditions based on the presence or absence of a bubble in the durum tube, the bubble being either CO2 or hydrogen gas. And those are also byproducts of fermentation. Note that there does not need to be both a color change and gas production for that to be considered positive for fermentation, right? So this has a drastic drop in pH because of the color change is so drastic and also has quite a lot of gas production. So it's positive for color change and gas production, definitely fermenting that sugar, right? But this one is too. It doesn't have the gas bubble, but it does have the color change. So that one is fermenting the sugar. This one doesn't have the gas bubble. The color change is not as drastic but it has dropped in pH. So this one is fermenting and so is this one. It's difficult to see here but there is a tiny tiny little gas bubble at the top and there is a color change. It's not very drastic but it is lower pH. So this is also positive for fermentation. So you can have a color change, you can have a bubble in the durum tube, or you can have both. And all three of those scenarios indicates that yes, it is fermenting the sugar. And you ask, well, what's happening here? Is this a negative test? No, this is not a test. This is a negative control. So you would have a negative control tube for any of your fermentation tests or any of your phenol red fermentation tests so that you can compare the negative to the test. Because if I didn't have the test tube here, I might say that this, these two are negative because they look much redder than these, but in fact, they're not red at all. They're more of like a orange color compared to the negative control, right? So that's why you use the negative control. It's for comparison. So for experiment one, you're going to watch this video here, and you're going to observe the fermentation test 
For two species, you have Pseudomonas originosa and Staphylococcus aureus. And for each of those, there's going to be three test tubes, one for each of three sugars. They're both being tested to see if they can ferment sucrose or glucose or lactose. And each test tube is presented alongside a negative control for comparison. And you're going to observe and record for each of these tests whether it's positive or negative for fermentation based on the color and whether or not you have gas production. Make sure to answer all the guided questions in your report template for those. Next we'll have the catalase test. Most aerobic bacteria produce hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct of aerobic cellular respiration pathways. In general, hydrogen peroxide is toxic to cells. It damages DNA and cell membranes. But some bacteria, including Staphylococcus, produce an enzyme called catalase, which breaks down this toxic hydrogen peroxide into harmless water and oxygen. This test is often used to identify bacteria of the Staphylococcus genus and in fact we often use it to separate staphylococcus from streptococcus especially in like quick diagnostic testing. The test can be performed on a microscope slide or by adding hydrogen peroxide directly to the medium containing bacterial growth like you see here and here. These figures both show hydrogen peroxide reacting with the enzyme. It's quickly broken down into water and oxygen resulting in all this bubbling. And you've seen this before if you have ever put hydrogen peroxide on a wound and you see the bubbling. Well that bubble means that you have a bunch of staph in that wound. It also means that the hydrogen peroxide is not killing that staph because it's turning the hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen, right? So you have a positive catalase here, positive catalase here, and then negative catalase here. So in this situation, these bacteria are not producing catalase, so that hydrogen peroxide is killing them. And they're most likely not Staphylococcus. For experiment two, you will complete a simulated catalase test at this link here. Be sure to make note of all of the procedural steps and the experimental results so that you can discuss these in the report template. Finally, we will have the oxidase test. The oxidase test is linked to the electron transport chain the oxidase test helps to differentiate species by their ability or inability to utilize the ATC as it is an aerobic process. So in aerobic respiration, the final electron acceptor at the end of the ETC is an oxygen molecule that becomes reduced to water by the final ETC carrier, which is cytochrome oxidase. Cytochrome oxidase differs between bacterial types and can be used to differentiate closely related bacteria for diagnostic purposes. At the very least, if a specimen produces cytochrome C oxidase, then you know that it can tolerate oxygen and use ETC to make energy. For example, the gram-negative Pseudomonas aeruginosa and gram-negative Vibrio cholerae use cytochrome C oxidase, which can be detected using the oxidase test, whereas other gram-negative Enterobacteraceae like E. coli are negative for this test because they produce a different cytochrome oxidase other than cytochrome C oxidase. For experiment three, you will complete a simulated oxidase test. Here is the simulation link. Again, be sure to note all procedural steps and experimental results so that you can speak to these in your lab report. Observations for these tests, you want to make sure that you understand why some bacteria use fermentation to make energy, what are the byproducts of fermentation, how are they observed. For the catalase test, what metabolic processes are associated with catalase production, what is the byproduct of this reaction, how is it observable. For the oxidase test, which metabolic processes are associated with cytochrome C oxidase and how is it possible to observe the cytochrome C oxidase production in the lab. Thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments below.